It's exactly how I understand history, how I see this discipline. For me, it, it would be, I would say, boring to just look at a source and say, right, that's how things were like. For me, there's a lot of interpreting, there's a lot of to guess. It's almost like detec detective work. Sometimes. Putting the puzzle together. Yeah, to put the puzzle together of how people lived hundreds of years ago. So we're here with Alessandro de Arcangelist. And we're going to talk about history today. He's a university professor here in UCL. University College London, that's right. Yes, we did a lot of practice before <laughs> to get that right. Yeah. Okay, you are very young for a professor. You are yeah. how, how old are you? Uh, I'm 31, nearing 32. And how you are a professor so, and you well, are that a young? A professorship is something you, you get much later in career. Technically, I'm a lecturer. I think in the United States, people start using the denomination of professor much earlier. It's a different academic system. So um, I'm fairly young for what I do. That's true. But I think it's because I've just never really stopped. Like I've always been driven by this passion for learning. So I did my undergraduate, then came to London for an MA, immediately went to do a PhD and then worked, worked, worked until I was offered this job here at UCL. Okay, so a lot of work. A lot to of get work, but also a lot of luck, to be fair. I <laughs> found myself being the right person at the right time a couple of times, and that helped enormously in terms of advancing my career. Yes, every, every successful person, this is what they say. <laughs> I've been very lucky, so luck plays a role, as I understand. It, it, I think it plays a big role. I, 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 don't wanna, I don't wanna say, you know, of course, I must have been to some extent good at what I was doing to get where I am. Are you sure? But, uh, <laughs> that's what they say. It is. But um, uh, yeah, I think circumstances played a big role. So we're going to learn history today, right? We're going to do our best. Yes, absolutely. I have, I'm not uh, the best in history. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So let. W what exactly do you focus on history, you personally? So thanks for the question, Fidias. So my focus is mostly on 18th and 19th century intellectual history, the history of ideas. I mostly focus on European intellectual history uh, with the particular focus on uh, ideas of politics and ideas of time. I'm very interested in how people thought about time, how people started thinking differently about time, history and progress throughout the 18th and 19th century and how that process had an impact with regard to how people conceived political participation. So 18th century and 19th so, century, yeah. mostly in Europe. Precisely. And all the idea, ideologies of the people that they had at yeah. that time. Absolutely. So we're talking about science, we're talking about uh, what are their ideas um, that people I'm, had. So science plays a big role. I do teach quite a, a couple of courses that also deal with the history of science. Um, but in, in conjunction with, with ideas about science, I'm very interested in ideas of politics, the notion of sovereignty, revolution, What sovereignty means? Well, you're very welcome to take one of my courses and in 20 weeks, I'll try to explain to you what sovereignty means. But for the most part... <laughs> let's do it, not tw 20 lectures, let's do it in 20 minutes. seconds. <laughs> so sovereignty has to do with the question of what is the source of political power? Where does political power come from? For many centuries, it was customary to think that the power of a king, for example, emanated from God, that the king was some sort of, um, was ruling over the people on behalf of God. Interesting. Whereas sometimes throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, people started believing, actually, people have the power, like the song goes. People have the power, you know? Um, and um, uh, that led people to do some very, very important things, like the French Revolution, for example. That's, of course, the big exemplification, but for the most part... Why the French Revolution is an important thing? Um, well, well, by the way, we're going to jump around to so many I topics. I like that. That's, that's exactly my thought process. I'm <laughs> glad they were. Really. So why was the French Revolution so important? Um, I think it was very important because it had such a massive global impact. All of a sudden it happened and it did when, when it happened? 1789 until sort of sometime in the mid 1790s, usually 1795, 96. Um, and can you give me a picture of the world at that time? Uh, yeah, so at the, the world at the time was very much uh, anchored to a sort of colonial style economy. Uh, empires were all the rage at the time. France itself, for example, they had 
present-day Haiti was a French colony, which was home to the largest slave population in the world and produced 60% of the world's sugar at the time. So you can imagine it was a big deal. It, a lot of money came from the colonies. But at the same time, domestically, France um, functioned using this very old-fashioned so-called ancien regime, old regime. So it was a very sort of classist, we'd say today, society. It was called the system of estates, where the first two estates, namely the nobility and the clergy, they enjoyed a number of benefits, so they didn't pay taxes, for example. And 95% of the French population at the time were peasants who had to pay a lot of taxes, also on behalf of those who didn't. And um, they were just very poor and they were starving because a series of failed harvests, really bad weather meant that there was not enough food. This also combined with the rise of a number of ideologies and ideas of revolution, popular sovereignty, like democracy. So it was, back then it was the printing press, so there yeah. was books, but not the, uh, the industrial revolution. Industrial revolution happens a bit later, but it's very interesting that you mentioned the printing press. Yesterday, actually, I was giving one of my final classes of the I year. did it because of that, because I knew what you did yesterday. Good. <laughs> exactly, of course. So um, there's a guy called Condorcet, who was one of the greatest revolutionary thinkers of all time and he was a big protagonist in the French Revolution and he wrote a book in which he made a big deal out of the invention of the printing press and he says that played a huge role in um, spreading sorts of new political ideas and awakening this new political conscience among the people and of course a few hundred a couple hundred years later you get to when uh, the printing press happen 16th century so 200 years before... Yeah, I would say it's a good 200 years. Yeah. Uh, but of course, there's, um, it's not a homogeneous pre- process throughout the entire world. You know, So there are parts of... Uh, of, of so it's happening slowly. Yeah. That's why it's very difficult to answer the question because you can actually see that uh, the same argument about literacy and people's ability to read all these ideas applies to the French Revolution. But 10 years later, in 1799, the Neapolitan Revolution, P.S. I'm from Naples, so this is a very important topic for me. Um, most of the population at the time was illiterate. Naples is in Italy. Yeah, south of Italy. <laughs> Greatest place on earth, I should say. Um, and a lot, of the revolu- a lot of the people, they just couldn't read. So you couldn't think of the press, newspapers, for example, as a means of propaganda to spread revolutionary ideas. So for me to understand, how many years do you think it took for the, these papers, these books mm. to travel around the world? Well, I from think the time it happened. one theme is the circulation of books and ideas which to be honest was near instant near instant you can actually see news of the french revolution circulating in haiti just a few weeks later because in haiti you mean in africa and haiti in in the caribbean present-day haiti at the time called saint domingue which used to be a french colony and they had their own revolution and a lot of historians say that it was stimulated as well by the french revolution and there was a great degree of circulation but another thing is the wider issue of who exactly was able to read this news and these sources? There's a question of literacy oh, here. Oh, so it was mostly the rich. It was mostly people who knew how to read. And yes, it, there and is an economic... Did they teach people how to read back then in school? Or like, so probably not before, no, but that, after the yeah, revolution it started. Absolutely. The idea of kind of mass schooling is a relatively kind of new concept in in European history. Of course, there will have been plenty of even so-called enlightened monarchs. They were talking about great systems of education. In the 18th century, you have, for example, in Prussia, the first great effort to create a national system of mass education. But at the same time, Europe was very uneven in terms of its social and political development. So, for example, the south of Italy, where I'm from, it's not until the very late 19th century that you can speak of a truly effective system of mass schooling. 19th century? Yeah, okay. 1800s. So almost like 140 years ago. But how how did, did, did people learn to read all this? Pre- like it was probably... Some people could afford to send their kids to school. And ah, so they, schools were was not mass. It was only for the elites. Uh, uh, you would send, yes, because if you were, for example, so if you were, for instance, say a peasant working in agriculture, you would want your kids to help you work the land. There's no point sending them to school. 
So everyone kind of, let's imagine, like they were agriculture. In France, for example, one of the, of the, the, the themes that surrounded this course of revolution is this crisis of agriculture. It's a economic... What do you mean crisis of, um, of agriculture? Well, first, there's the big issue that a lot of the, the harvests failed and people were absolutely starving. But then there's also the problem that because there was some sort of rising middle class in the urban centers, Paris mostly, a huge divide was being born between the countryside of, sort of allegedly backwards peasantry and this more sort of emerging middle class of proto-industrial revolution, so to speak, um, uh, characters. Okay, so we're, now we'll go back to what you said. Uh, of So it started because of this idea, started because of the printing press. The world was like mostly agriculturist. Yeah. And yeah. then how does this transition? Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it, the printing press, you know, which was already in place, played a big role in disseminating these ideas. But I think where it started, it started from a profound socioeconomic crisis that Europe was going through at the time. The old system of how society... That happened because of what? It happened because it was unsustainable. The rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. It was a system that was fundamentally based on this profound inequality between those who had all this political privileges, such as not paying taxes, and those who instead had to put in the work and pay a lot of extra taxes. So taxes on top of it was governments back then? It's, it's, it's also a question of government, absolutely, completely. It's, uh, it's government, but it's more of a political culture that is just completely rotten. So France had its yeah. own government back then, and like yeah. Italy had it, its own Italy government? Italy did not exist yet as a country. Italy was divided, divided into, yeah, that's another big thing. Yeah, it was a combination of, you know, a plethora of uh, a few dozen independent so states. these countries kind of uh, shaped happen after the war yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the this first war, uh, war. The, the italy was created as a country in 1861 as the kingdom of italy um after a very kind of complicated um so after mm, those ideas got popularized that yes yes there about. is a huge a huge um, kind of question about to what extent it's this new political ideas emerging from the French Revolution spread to the through the rest of Europe, and what role did they play in the process of unification of countries like Italy and Germany? Uh, there is obviously the other big the elephant in the room here being Napoleon, who actually presented himself as the champion of the French Revolution, the one who had triumphed in the revolution and. He wanted to sort of export the ideas of the revolution. Now, why did he want to do that? Because he wanted to create a system of satellite states. Italy was the first, one of the first places where he went to, to create the so-called sister republics. So in a way, this notion of um, um, kind of... What, what I, was the benefit for him to create... To, money. To crea money, this resources. More... Napoleon had a very, very, very... Um, uh, clear um, principle that war has to pay for itself. So you cannot run wars at a loss. So, oh, um, clever guy. He, <laughs> he saw <laughs> wars like business. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> completely. And uh, he, um, um, and I think, and and with with profit, uh, <laughs> always in my yeah. so fun. <laughs> Big business. He was a great entrepreneur from, from that <laughs> point of view. Um, and then I think he also, because at the time, during the revolution, pretty much every single European country, almost, decided to declare war against France, it was very convenient for France to have a system of buffer states around France itself. They could sort of protect it from invasions from other countries. And what exa so what age, were what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, uh, chronology. Guys. So we're, we're looking at in Italy, for example, the Napoleonic years is 1796 to 1799. So it's exactly before this revolution. It's right what? after the French Revolution, and it is happening at the same time as the Haitian Revolution in Haiti in the Caribbean. And in fact, you know the famous Louisiana Purchase, how the present-day United States acquired Louisiana. It was Napoleon that sold it because he was too broke after he was defeated in Haiti. And he said he needed war to pay for itself. You cannot run a deficit when you go to war. So we need to sell Louisiana to make up for some of the losses. Interesting. Yeah, it's all interconnected. I think this is the really cool thing so about- So Elon yeah. Musk was the equivalent, like they saw, like we build business now and Tesla and all this stuff, was the equivalent kind of with the wars back then, like? 
I mean, I think in the <laughs> it, it, for me to kind of draw a distinction. Because... Yeah, that's 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 interesting. Armin. I think the point is that there is at some point something happens in European societies, and people think, right, we actually can't make money and we can make more and more money the birth of capitalist society modern commercial society Karl Marx for example writes a lot about this um, and I would say that definitely one of the things that happen in parallel with this industrial revolution all these political changes is that there is the birth like the, the spread the irresistible spread of capitalism uh, and societies become much where, more where, when it starts i would say that this is it starts and, and it's because yeah. of the printing press and because printing press of all these ideas that you're saying it's one of the ideas printing the press, capitalism yes that. the printing press plays a big role in this and actually a lot of people uh max weber Karl marx they would say that the birth of capitalism happens more or less at the same time as the invention of the printing press and certainly it's hugely facilitated by the printing press um So we're, look, we're looking at, at, at some developments that begin sometime in the 16th, 17th century, but then they really fully take off around the sort of late 18th, early 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. Interesting. Can you paint me a, a picture of the war at 1918? Uh, 1918. When the, Nap uh, oh, so the Napoleonic, so uh, yeah, after uh, what was the age that happened? Uh, so it's at the end of the of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. So yes, it's the 1800s. 19th century. So what century. was it like? There was like, a guy called. Yeah. Pain everyday life yeah. of people there. Um, very hungry, very cold, very poor, uh, very very traumatized by what had happened. Uh, Some, by the Napoleonic Wars? Mostly by, the, by what happened with the French Revolution, because we like to think the French Revolution was great and it kind of created modern political consciousness. No. What is it, the French Revolution, for people like me that does, don't a, know? Like, very what cool, happened exactly? It's a very cool set of ideas. The French people rising up to destroy and smash the Ancien Regime, this really oppressive political system. But then something went profoundly wrong and it became the so-called terror when people who called themselves the Jacobins, the revolutionaries, they started killing other revolutionaries because they thought, wait, these are enemies of the revolution. So the French Revolution started off really cool. People really believed in it. But then everybody was massively disappointed when it became one of the most bloody and violent things in human history. Um, so yeah, quite shocking. So there's this big trauma, the French Revolution, and then the next trauma, the Napoleonic Wars. So imagine within... So the after those two events, the people were starving, the people were cold, and the people lost poor. hope kind yeah. of in the... Yeah. Now what happens then, there has to be something that gives people hope after that, right? So people te historians tend to say that, that the age, so-called age of nationalism, this idea of these people, people's... Absolutely, pr somewhat primal in a way, very passionate belief in the nation is what kind of gives them hope and rallies them behind these pol new political ideas of the 19th century. I think it's a very fascinating story. Uh, I, I want to go back to understand also sure. how, what was the transportation that the people like traveled uh, from their village or they only stayed? By coach mostly. Horseback? Horse. Yeah. Horses and, and, was and the transportation. Coach, yeah. What what you said? Co coach. So with the what is this? The coach pulled by horses. Maybe oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Wow. So they didn't kind of leave their village for. It no. was only around the area that yeah. they were. This is a very interesting. You've actually touched upon a very interesting of point. Of course, I knew it. It's yeah. an interesting point. I'm joking. <laughs> so the thing is that people tend to think that if you lived, say. In Naples in the 19th, in the early 19th century, you felt like an Italian. If you lived in Lyon or Toulouse in the 19th century, you felt like a Frenchman. In practice, people's allegiance, their sense of belonging was not really to these big nations, but it tended to be mostly to kind of- Drop the mic. Exactly. <laughs> local <laughs> political entities. So if you ask somebody from Naples, where are you from? They say, well, I'm from Naples, I'm Neapolitan. You know, that's 
what their identity was about. And that's because people didn't travel much. People were kind of living very isolated lives in many ways. And when this started changing, that they started traveling, there was railroads and... Uh, well, again, it's a very dishomogeneous process. In the north of Europe, it happens much sooner than in the south of Europe. Um, Why? Uh, because poverty, really. Uh, and because actually Italy especially had gone through this very complicated process of emancipation. What from, emancipation means? Because basically Italy was very divided and there were people that saw themselves as affiliated with the French, other parts of Italy that were in the hands of the Austrians and the whole of the South, which was the so-called kingdom of the two Sicilies, which was p ruled by the Bourbon monarchy who are originally Spanish. So it was a very deeply divided country. Um, there was no reason why anybody would want to, should buy, sh sorry, should build a railroad connecting, say, Turin to Naples. That happens much later after the unification. And in fact, transportation and railroads were one of the kind of great policies that were pursued by the government of the Kingdom of Italy after the unification, because you could physically and metaphorically bring people together by building railroads. Interesting. So... After the countries were developed, that was kind of a way to make people feel like this is your country. Exactly. And this is one of the most, to me as a southerner, as a Neapolitan, it's one of the most interesting and at the same time irritating features of the history of my own country. The fact that our sense of collective belonging, our sense of being Italian, is, has been largely constructed very artificially through the policies of the, 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 the monarchy after the unification. If you go and look at the sources, on the eve of unification, 1861, very few Italians saw themselves as part of a unified nation state. Most people wanted a federal solution as a kind of confederation of the existing states. It's okay to be, to have an Italian state, but Italians are did not see themselves that much as a nation. Sure, there were several Italians that viewed themselves that way, and they were a very, very kind of vocal group, but that's by no means the majority. Do you think, let's go uh, Naples mm. and Milan. Yeah. Do you think people were very different? Completely. In, in those two different places? Yeah, completely. A and after the ro railroad stuff, it started, uh, yes. started kind of being similarities. Yeah. That's so fascinating. I think man. it's because That's so all of a sudden, you remember we talked about this question of uh, of optics, of what's your allegiance? Is it local? Is it national? Is it bigger? Within a few years, Italy went, so 1861 unified at a time when people's allegiance was still very local. And then all of a sudden, something like less than 50, 60 years later, people start, start realizing, oh man, we live in a completely interconnected world. We go from the local to the global within the blink of an eye. And that really changes people's perspective. And I think that's when you start seeing a more genuine sense of Italian nationhood, because people realize, well, we're all in this together. We might as well. Oh my God, and it's happening now. The same thing with the countries all together. Yeah. Fucking hell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that must have been the reaction of many people at the time as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, completely. Um, if you think about it, uh, how also the, the idea of Italy becomes a big thing through the wave of migration to the beginning of the, of the 20th century. I mean, you're in the States and you'll know very well how many Italians there are there, especially in the East Coast, and how many people have Italian surnames. If you go to South America, Uruguay, a third of the people that live in Uruguay have Italian surnames. That is quite shocking. And that tells you about the extent of the migrations. That, so that tells you two things. It tells you first that there is, that things weren't that great in Italy at the time if everybody wanted to leave. <laughs> and second, it also tells you, it, it hints at the fact that some sort of nationhood So interesting that you see, you, you find hints from looking the you from looking history you you cannot really understand what happened but you can find hints exactly. that gives you that is exactly how i understand history how i see this discipline for me it it would be i would say boring to just look at a source and say right that's how things were like for me there's a lot of interpreting there's a lot of 
it's very imaginative. You know, you have to to guess. It's almost like detec- detective work. Sometimes. Putting the puzzle together. Yeah, to put the puzzle together of how people lived hundreds of years ago. Can, can you tell me, like, yeah. most of our knowledge about history, where it comes from? Is it from um, sources? If it's yeah. from books? Is it from uh, that is, that is YouTubers? That sounds like a very kind of simple question, but in fact, it's one of the most widely contested and debated topics in our field. Um, oh my who, God, I, I'm impressed with myself today. I'm you asking should. good questions. <laughs> who, who are we getting our information from? And why should we believe it? And why should you all believe me telling you all this stuff, for example? Um, so, Because I chose you. That's why. You should shut up and believe. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> Our knowledge of history comes exactly from people's ability to challenge what you just said. Just shut up and believe. You know what I, mean? <laughs> um, I think what I do as a historian is to take sources that maybe, for example, a lot of historians have already written about and actually say, nah, I read this stuff differently. I think that what happened is different. So for me, you never, people tend to think that historians are people that just discover new things about the past. I honestly can't remember the last time that anybody has discovered discovered anything new there's a lot of interpreting and reinterpreting that we do but that's what makes our job really interesting you know um we get to uncover narratives and stories and histories that a lot of people have completely neglected and i think that's so so exciting so what are the uh, what are the ways that we learn from the yeah. about history so i think the first thing that we learn from history and in some ways from the work of historians is the is an idea that was actually introduced by none other than galileo galilei 410 years ago the idea that your ability to produce any knowledge de- hinges and depends on your ability to question the standards, to question the consensus, to question the status quo. So I always tell my students, you need to be inquisitive. If I'm telling you to read a source, a secondary source, some historian's work, I just, I don't want you to agree with the guy. I want you to disagree because that's what's going to push the knowledge even further. I also think that we can learn very important lessons with regard to how we today see the world. And I know this sounds a bit simplistic, but to me, really understanding the historical process that has led to the creation of the Italian nation state is something which makes me understand so much about where I come from, my ideas, your relatives, my reality, your exactly. Ideas. And you know, sometimes this works in a very subtle manner because when I was in school in Italy, for instance, and they told me all about Italian history, never for a second I was thinking I would question what I was learning. And then I came to the UK and I was studying this stuff at a more advanced level and realized actually all the stuff I was, a lot of the stuff I was told, not all, a lot of the stuff I was told about the creation of the Italian state is just not 100% accurate. So I think- Oh my God, what you are saying is like schools are not accurate 100%. Yeah, I mean, everybody who says anything about anything has some kind of bias, right? So I'm pretty sure that somebody who might be watching or listening to us talking would say, well, who's this guy? What is he talking about? Italian history is very different to the way he's... But I think that's good. I want that kind of dialogue. I want to disagree with other historians because because it's only through this degree of disagreement that we can end up advancing the knowledge. So for me to kind of rephrase what we said, yeah. let's say uh, you are watching an event that happened, let's say, the, Napo- the, Re- the French Revolution. The French Revolution. And you are like seeing it in a kind of different perspective. And you said, oh my God, there is a lot of people, for example, that immigrated from Italy. And that kind of shows uh, something about Italy that is not what we learn. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You go and invest. So this is kind of where history Precisely. is. Precisely. I'm going to give you a very simple example, which is based on my own research. So whenever people talk about Italian history, they always tend to view it in terms, in in purely national terms, which means it's Italians, people who lived in the Italian peninsula, who decided one day they were fed up with the existing system of governments, all the existing states, they wanted to come together as a nation state, and then they rallied behind Piedmont in the Northwest, and Italy was made. A bit more complicated, but that's the kind of short story. What I noticed is that there's actually a lot of 
foreign influences that affected this process of Italian unification. So for example, my own research deals very extensively with how ideas coming, political ideas and historical concepts coming from Germany, 19th century Germany, intersected with debates on the Italian unification. So I do a lot of what's called transnational history. And I think that that's really the future of our discipline, you know, going beyond this this framework of the nation state. So yeah, you just realize that there's more going on than we think. So we add new knowledge. And as we do that, we come to, I hope, a more nuanced and accurate understanding of what happened in the past. But we're always going to not be 100% accurate. accurate. Yeah, absolutely. But that's something you kind of, you know what you're getting into. You know what I mean? Like you, you accept they, there is no such thing as objective knowledge. But we want to get as close to the truth. Yeah. This absolutely. is kind of, but, I mean, should be our aspiration. It, you know, I, I, this is a very personal thought. I'm, it's just a personal belief of mine, which might be quite wacky, but I do not believe in the concept of like true exact knowledge. If you think about it, even with science, you know, we think of natural sciences as exact sciences. And then all it takes is a Higgs boson right, to realize that the whole model of physics, that, that there is so much more to how physics works. Oh, so you, Higgs boson is like that space and time is not... No, it's not... the idea that there are subatomic particles. All it takes is, is an Ein, Albert Einstein in the relativity theory to question the most basic assumptions of physics. So I, again, I don't think it's... I don't think it's in any way helpful to think that we, that we can come to a conclusive argument, a conclusive answer to particular questions, especially when it comes to historical questions. So you are basically saying that everything we know is wrong. No, I'm saying that everything we know could be wrong and it's up to us to struggle to refine our understanding and to get as close as possible to that which was the historical truth of things. I don't think it's a, it's a cynical argument. I think it's actually a very sort of positive and empowering perspective, at least the way I see it. It makes me want to study more, learn more, and write more about these things to understand these things better. So let's go to a topic close to my heart, sure. which is kind of the political systems that they had yeah. back then and like what we can learn mm -hmm. from those and capitalism, and Marx, Marxism, or whatever, yeah. the, all these. Yeah, so what can we learn from these things? I think you can get an absolute- And maybe paint us a picture on how yeah. all this stuff happened. Yeah. So I think what you can learn is mainly, it's like a masterclass on how not to rule a country. <laughs> um, meaning it's, it's never a good idea to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. It's never a good idea to give kind of big benefits and big sort of uh, privileges to um, people who are not necessarily the working class, so to speak, at least from the perspective of 18th century um, estate system. So I think what really got people angry in the 18th century is the fact that everybody was working. Everyone was working very hard. Everybody was massively exploited, right? What exploited means? Meaning you work a lot. You don't really get paid much. Um, if, for example, um, you were born in, in many parts of Europe, serfdom was a thing, meaning that if you were born to a family of, say, peasants, by the way, if you were born in 18th century France, there's about 95% chance that you were born as a peasant, right? In many parts what of- What peasant you, mean? Um, somebody who works in agriculture. Okay. Uh, but who is, who, in those parts of Europe where serfdom really exist, still existed, serfdom means that you are attached to the land. So you can't, there's no social mobility. You were telling me earlier, Phidias, how, you know, you wanted to build a career in entertainment and you've done it. And that is the meaning of social mobility. You know, you kind of moved away from your home country, you moved to a different place, and now you're traveling the world pursuing a dream. That, to me, is evidence of the possibility to kind of social, mo social mobility. mobility. That wasn't a thing. So um, yes. there are only very, very few, um, very few exceptions to this rule. 
Um, when people yeah. started kind of having social mobility, like well, because I heard some stories of people going yeah. with a boat to Australia or yeah. with a boat to America, when this I think that is a result of mostly sort of nineteenth century. Well, first you need to have a first wave of great political change with this wave of revolutions from say seventeen. So that what you are describing was kind of the blo- building the blocks. Yeah, absolutely. To, uh, I think then we have a, a the rise of liberal politics, for example which which engender a much greater p- emphasis on notions of individual rights, individual freedoms, etc. So in that case, you start seeing a much greater sense of, well, I call it social mobility. And I think also there is a, a, a much more, you know, if you think until the ni- sort of early 19th century, it's very easy to just say this first, second, third estate societies become much, much more complex as a result of the Industrial Revolution as well. The the so-called notion of division of labor, for example, means that the production process becomes so granular and so divided that actually new classes are born. I watched a very good play, by the way, the other night called The Lehman Trilogy, which tells the story of the Lehman Brothers Investment Bank. Um, And it makes a big deal out of the fact that it's that the genius of these people um, who worked, who directed the bank was really to be one step ahead of the general kind of, of, of the market, but mostly in terms of anticipating how labor will get increasingly divided. Um, they, they, they find pride in their role, in the play, they find, the protagonists find pride in their role of middlemen. And I think they understand middlemen to be a bit like that, you know? division of labor there is increasingly increasing specialization you do less but you do it better you do it in a much more kind of narrow sense if that makes sense yes i'm sure it made sense to the clever viewers not 100 percent to <laughs> me but <laughs> but i i want to go a bit and like build around mm-hmm. the heart of my the topic for my heart which is what we did you said we learned how to not create democracy how to not run a country yes so talk uh, a bit more about this yes absolutely so um today we take for granted that we live in democracies right uh, we take for granted all these notions like human rights etc all these things that for us are the building blocks of our western democracies none of that was in place in the 18th century with very few exceptions some but few exceptions um if you lived in an ancien regime old regime style uh, monarchy you would be subject to the arbitrary will of a king a king who in many cases had legislative power so the king could decide what laws go and what laws stay um you would also have to pay a lot of taxes to essentially pay for the benefits of a class of landowners, mostly. So, so first, uh, first, you, it was not like a person ruling countries because we didn't have countries at the beginning. Well, of France the- was already, you know, a country pretty much in the same way as we understand it today, with the same kind of boundaries. And the the French king was. You know, an absolutist monarch. Remember Louis the Fourteenth in the in the seventeenth century, seventeenth or eighteenth, who said, "Let us say, I am the state." Imagine if, for example, Joe Biden tomorrow gives a, a press release, "I am the state." How people would react? You know what I mean? That really tells you that it, it, it's a very different political mentality. We started actually this this chat talking about sovereignty, where power comes from, right? And that's exactly what um, um, uh, the the issue at stake here. In the 18th century, uh, sovereignty is in the hands of one individual, of a king. And he can do whatever he wants because it's his country. So it doesn't sound very nice, does it? You know? So eventually, that means that the state functions as a machine that preserves that status quo. It preserves that system of, (coughs) excuse me, it preserves that system of privileges and that degree of oppression of the people. <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to have a sip. Yes, we allow you to have as many sips as, as you want. Because we live in a democracy and you're not <laughs> the king, right? <laughs> so, um, <coughs> what were we talking about? So, um, that, that's why I was saying, you know, it's a masterclass on how not to rule a country. But when, uh, f- so you said it was a country, uh, France <laughs> wa- was a country back then. 
So uh, when other countries started forming and when democracy kind of first appeared in this... Democracy actually appeared in ancient Athens like thousands of years ago. Interesting. That's why, dem- you know, the Greek word, demos, people, you know, mm. it's a power to the people. Uh, of course, it's very different to the democracy we mean today. I mean, it, at the t- in ancient Greece, for example, it was political participation, political power hinged on people's um, wealth and whether or not they they, they own property. So it in, whereas in the late 18th, early 19th century, it's linked with a system of rights, for example, which is very, very different. So it would be very wrong to say and, that. And who decided all this rights thing and like how the, how does a democracy starts to from dictatorship transition to mm-hmm. these things yes. that so have during the French Revolution, people uh, started invoking the notion of popular sovereignty. That basically power did not emanate from the king, but it emanated from the people. If you think about it, it makes sense. 95% of the French population, aka the people, they were the ones that were working, they were the ones that were paying taxes, they were single-handedly running the show. Everybody else was pretty much a parasite. So it made sense that they were the ones that, from whom power emanated. Um, that's interesting. In the, um, uh, that's the way you should think about stuff. <laughs> I know, right? that's, why, that's why it's a big deal, the French Revolution. Um, constitutions then were a very big deal. Uh, the constitution, the modern concept of the constitution enshrined all these kind of beliefs into a system of, into a code of law, really. Um, and of course, different constitutions, they result in states functioning in different ways. And even within France itself, you have a series of different constitutions throughout the whole revolutionary process, which frame popular so- well, the concept of sovereignty in different ways. But I would say it's a combination of these kind of ideas plus the constitution. Interesting, but the people, the kind of the uh, railroads had to happen first because people had to kind of talk with the other people to yeah. start thinking that we need power to the people. So that's one, again, <laughs> you've touched upon a hugely controversial topic. So one of the biggest debates during the French Revolution, for example, was a debate on representation in the sense that how do we govern a country in a way, if, if power lies with the people, how do we get everybody involved into this political process? Well, for many, according to many thinkers and political uh, politicians, even at the time, the answer lies in representation. So people vote, they, this is what we do today. We vote somebody who represents us. And by representing us, it doesn't mean that they just relay our, you know, voices and our choices, but we trust them to choose on our behalf, right? Other people instead had more of a problem with the notion of representation and instead they wanted more of a kind of direct type of democracy, in which case they talked about some sort of devolution of power to local parliaments, so the small assemblies, and then who decide? Somebody from the assembly goes into a bigger assembly where they decide, and the whole thing escalates until all these individual voices are kind of collected into the National Assembly. It's not very practical at all. And that's one of kind of big pitfalls of the sort of uh, the Jacobin. So a lot pre- of layers. Yeah, yeah. There is a system of devolution. So it's either representation or kind of devolution. So you either go uh, with people that choose direct the National Assembly on behalf of everybody else, or you start this more granular process of kind of collecting everyone's. Uh, opinions. So this is uh, in in uh, a, an example of what you have now is like when we have the Congress mm. and the is this is what you are. I think so. For uh, me to uh, uh, in the we in the West we don't really do um, this sort of direct democracy that the Jacobins had in mind because it's very impractical. We have a massive belief in. Uh, Represent the power of representation. So whenever you vote, whenever I vote, whenever you vote, we are voting for our representatives. So people who choose on our behalf, and we trust them to make choices which are consistent with what we would choose if we were in their place. Um, so the point is basically choosing a CEO. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, CEO, CEO of the country. Yeah, I think it's a good comparison. <laughs> yeah. Um, during the French Revolution, I mean, as I said, this this view was came under attack by the Jacobins. And the point is that when the French gen- Revolution degenerated into the terror, the Jacobins sort of seized power and things got really, really messy at that point. 
So I think one of the reasons why throughout the 19th century there was a massive, a massive uh, kind of critique of ideas of direct democracy or, you know, this kind of devolution into to local parliaments is that those were the ideas of the Jacobins and the Jacobins were the violent ones. They were those who had killed even other Jacobins. You know? So at what uh, age were starting to have democracies around Europe? I think what we call democracy in the modern sense, I would say, is pretty much the result of a series of revolutions that happened in the first half of the 19th century. I would say... Oh, so everything thing was kind of a step, a building block to build on this. Completely. Thing. I would say the 1848 revolution. And everything were, that we described, it was kind of a building blocks. Now we, we were talking about all the village were not connected. And like, mm -hmm. so we we're kind of painting the yeah. picture from the bottom, how the printing press was another block, the yeah. railroads, the revolution, and all this yeah. stuff and, the, and now we're uh, exactly. I love it they were painting a puzzle here and it started coming together exactly. guys exactly. <laughs> that's exactly what it is um, so what age uh, I would say 18 um, in the 1820s 30s and 40s is when you have a series of waves of revolutions throughout Europe and the wider world as well that kind of largely contribute to the modern day notion of democracy um, but then, to be honest, you could even argue that the real, the present idea of democracy is not born until after the Second World War, you know, because our idea of democracy is also very, very much the result of globalization and the result of a process, at least in Europe, European integration um, and the role of kind of transnational organizations. So, and, and to be honest, if you ask me personally, I would say that the current idea of democracy was maybe born in 2008 after the big financial crash, because that's changed so much how states function. It's, it's how? Um, it, well, I think democracy is so a very, we can, very fluid. So we can see history uh, like to events that happened in 2008. Okay. Yeah. You it's, talked about this building blocks theory, right? The idea that we there is a kind of sequential series of changes throughout European and world history that kind of leads us where we are more or less. Who said that the process is over? We're still very much on the process into, to build stuff. You know, it it um, it it's it's just it's still very kind of fluid. So we're, continue what you were saying about the 2008 and how oh, that yes. influenced. So I think in term, if you look at the monetary policies, for example, of the European Union, they have been massively affected by what happened in 2008. If I think about how the Greek state functions, if I think about austerity policies, now we are in the UK right now, where the current government, which has been in place for about 15 years, has pursued an austerity policy. A policy. What so austerity no, means? Hardly any public spending. Um, there's always, there's no money to spend on service and things, um, which is usually the antechamber of the argument for privatization, but we leave that aside. The um, all these things are the result of the big financial crash of, of 2008. If you look at how Greece functions, it's the result of 2008 because of their fiscal policies. If you look at how the European Union has worked since the financial crash of 2008, I mean, there's a direct connection. The, the, the European monetary policy that has played also a massive role in aggravating the situation with Greece in 2011 is the result of a global kind of recession that was engendered by the, the financial crash of 2008. You can actually see some parallels with 1929, you know, when there was the big depression. You can actually see things, a lot of parallels with events happening during the Cold War. I think that's one of the things that we're learning from history. At least that I, as individual, I'm learning from my work as a historian, that everything is so much more interconnected than we think. And maybe stuff that's happening now, Silicon Valley situation, right? People have started in America have been talking about that for about a couple of weeks, I think now. And only this week, you start really get, seeing the headlines in Europe because European governments are, begin, are waking up to the fact that, hang on, I mean, if we do not undertake important initiatives now, then we might end up like 2008 again. And we don't want that, of course. So it's this interconnectedness that I find so fascinating about my job. And for me, it's not just interconnectedness in space, Silicon Valley, UK, but it's interconnectedness in time. It's the past and the present that kind of are in dialogue. So let's talk a bit about like, what is kind of, a, for, if we see history, what is the kind of right way to build a 
a system. Let's forget mm. democracy or like capitalism, mm. like when like our bias of what we like or what we don't like. If we are going to build one system now, like what we do, like we, what do you think we should do? That's a very good question. I I don't think that there is a right answer. It's it's too big a question. But I what I would do. I mean, I'd really. Here's what I think. So I was born in 1991, and I remember growing up in the 90s in Italy, feeling fundamentally happy, feeling that things were going well. Mike, actually, Italy, the Italian economy was doing really well throughout the 90s. Then everything changed on September 11, 2001. And I feel like that that's when I I kind of understood what politics was about, that it really was a wake-up call. And I felt, even though I was more like 10 at the time, the world was never going to be the same. And since then, my the development of my political conscience, conscience has been a sequence of once-in-a-lifetime events, event after the next. It's a once-in-a-lifetime recession. It's a once-in-a-lifetime epidemic. It's a once-in-a-lifetime uh, financial crash, etc. So I feel like that um, I my generation, our generation, Filias, I think is growing up in a way that's very cynical. And it's actually becoming increasingly alienated and hopeless with regard to how the world works at the moment. So personally, I would say that the right way forward is just to start from scratch. I think that the current liberal capitalist paradigm is not one that's in the long run gonna survive. With what principles though? I start from scratch. Okay. So I pers again, this is just my own two cents and feel free to disagree. And I, I, I'm not claiming to speak on behalf of anyone with this, but I really do think that the more kind of collectivist and egalitarian society is really what we need. I think we live in a very individualistic society. And as a historian, I think that this comes from the last 200 years of liberal thinking and this completely shocking and stellar rise of capitalist society. You know, I really do think that these are things that worked very well for a couple hundred years, but now there's number one, too many of us on the planet. Second, the planet is dying. You know, the there are some key economics, political, and even ethical assumptions behind our current liberal capitalist system, which have put our planet in danger. For example, the idea of growth, right? We can pursue growth, unlimited growth, knowing that we're just going to get richer and richer and richer on the basis that we can draw from the resources of the planet as much as we want and that this will never run out. Well, guess what's happening? You know what I mean? That we are kind of running out of time, we're running out of resources, and there are more and more people that need to be fed. The problem with this is also that Climate change, which I definitely regard to be the greatest and most dangerous thing in the world at the moment. And I feel like that humanity is kind of sleepwalking into disaster here. um, is something which can have monstrous um, implications. Look, for example, what's happening in Pakistan now. In Pakistan, because of um, uh, climate change, a lot of the country is being flooded, right? So... Imagine if you're in LA, for instance, right? Imagine if as a result of climate change, LA gets completely flooded. Where do all the people from LA go? In America, you've got so many coastal cities, New York, Miami, LA, all these places, they could within say 100 years or something, if you carry on like this, they will get completely, they will be underwater. And what? where do all the people go? Imagine the wave of migration coming from less sort of developed parts of the world. And I'm thinking about the South, Asia or most of the African continent. That is something that, and I'm not saying this as in like we should protect Europe, not at all, but I'm, I think that there is a huge political problem about the extent of the migration ways. At the moment, politicians are kind of fighting each other over a handful of migrants who are completely desperate and they come to Europe in small boats because they're too hopeless to do anything else. What happens when there will not be a handful of boats, but it'll be something like millions of migrants. What's going to happen then? So I really do think that we need to think about much more sustainable forms of development. And to me, sustainability has to do with a more equitable distribution of resources. So that's how I was talking about a more collectivist type of society. There are lots of really interesting books about this um, and lots of interesting authors. And I don't want to sound like, you know, doom and gloom. If you think about it, 
one thing as a historian I've noticed is that whenever humans have a problem, they end up solving it. So I'm not trying to say we're screwed and we're all going to die. I would never, ever advocate the position, but we are in danger. The planet is in danger. Our political systems are in danger. And I think we should do something about it. That's interesting that you're saying that. You put it in perspective and that whatever problem we had, we solved it. But that, that means that we are going to solve the problem I think so. in, We've in made, the look, future. I think I'm, I try to be optimistic about this. You know, I think, of course, there have been many failures that people have made as they were trying to solve problems. There is no such thing as, you know, an infallible scientist or something. Uh, so many, uh, Albert Einstein himself, he made so many mistakes before he came to his groundbreaking theories. Uh, and my colleagues and myself have made so many mistakes in our lives and our careers. So this, I, uh, but I do think that, um, if you look at all the humanity has gone through over the last few thousand years, I know this is a very generic and uh, kind of perspective, but um, humans are very resilient beings. You know what I mean? Humans never give up. Well, you like know? cockroaches. Yeah. <laughs> In the post-apocalyptic world, <laughs> just be humans and cockroaches. Absolutely. Yes, but humans are very resilient. Humans fi- always find a way, I think. Um, and... Now, we, thanks to technology, information, means of communication, we are in a much more advanced position. We are much better off than people were. Think about, for example, when the plague happened. We have made, in, in the kind of, um, in, in the Middle Ages, it decimated the European population. At the time, people had no idea what it was because medicine had not developed. And of course, they did not have a vaccine against it. And so you can imagine that a plague a thousand years ago was a much, much bigger deal than COVID a few years ago. I'm not trying to demean the gravity of COVID. It was horrible when it happened. But if you put it in perspective, it was terrible. And yet people made it, you know? So I, let's say there is, uh, I'm from a country called Cyprus. Mm-hmm. And I, if I want, I think in the future, I have a possibility, let's say, if I want, to become the president of the country of you Cyprus. But like, what if, do you think in the current democracies that you have, do you think presidents are powerful? Um, or do you think the well, billionaires are more powerful? Or what do you, where do you think the actual power is? In the- that's a very good question. I do think that, uh, you know, um, as Karl Marx used to say, that a state, it does nothing other than perpetuating certain class interests of a sort of a hegemonic class. Um, I do think that at the moment, especially in in many Western countries, the UK being a prime example, you definitely see that there is the extent of the political lobbying, for example, that's done by big firms is just shocking and it's widely acknowledged. So I would say that a lot of decision-making power does not lie really with the politicians, but it lies with big capital. It lies with big money. Now, a lot of interesting people I know and people I like to read, mostly kind of lefty, thinkers they like they like to really critique that perspective and i think that that's i disagree with that i think of course there will be people with money you know we can't avoid that but so i do think that the real issue here is how is money employed you know how is this political decision making that stems from having a lot of money how is it directed and i do think that someone like say i don't know elon musk or jeff Bezos or any other mega wealthy person has a moral responsibility to kind of improve you know the world and they are the ones that should put the the money to the service of kind of addressing this urgent problems such as climate change. Now, the way people go about it at the moment, we could talk for hours about some of the problems, but that's not the point of our conversation. I mean, I do think that in terms of employment practices, there's so much to, much improvement that can be made. But at the same time, I do think that we are sort of going not necessarily in the wrong direction in you know seeing how a lot of people are committing their resources to improving the world. Bill Gates, for example, his philanthropy is absolutely fantastic. So there are some good people with a lot of money with good ideas. Not all of them, but a handful of really good ones are out there. What history 
teach you in your personal life? Such a good question. So as I come said, on, you're making no, you're honestly, making me feel clever. Like. Well, you, are, you are. Hey, we, we, you know, before we started this chat, we were talking about uh, why we do what we do, and and I said, you know, I just don't like the idea of being a historian that's stuck in a university. There is a kind of misconception of historians as being these clever people who are in their offices reading books and and writing articles that no one's going to read. I do think that we should bring all these messages. We should bring this knowledge to the wider public. And that's why I was so happy that you reached out to me. Um, so, and, and I think that your initiative to kind of present this type of content to a much bigger audience that I can possibly ever reach within the boundaries of this university is fantastic. So, and I, and I think historians are bringing kind of a really beautiful perspective in the conversations that we have. Because yeah, like I think Noval uh, Harari with his because he became recently very popular and all the he brings when you have us a perspective history and like uh, you have make a lot of you put you are saying oh, okay it's not a COVID is not the biggest problem in the world like you you bring so much in the table as a historian and I think. Uh, yeah, we need to have more yeah. historian yeah. perspectives in the yeah. table. To answer your question, what history has taught me in my personal life? As I said, I'm from Naples. I'm so from you probably got a lot of girlfriends because of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's only one woman in my life, and it's my mother. So uh. <laughs> <laughs> that's where you can tell. You know, tell me you're from the south of Italy without telling me you're from the south of Italy. Um, no, jokes aside, I think... Um, that was a joke? He, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Good point. So one thing that, you know, being a historian has taught me about my own my own self is really where I'm from. I grew up in Naples when I turned 18 was not a good time to be from Naples. Uh, there was a big garbage crisis. The local administration was corrupt and very ineffective. And I was looking forward to leaving. Uh, history has made me fall in love in Naples with Naples again. And I every time I I'm fl- I always get emotional on the plane whenever I'm flying and I can see the city, the Vesuvius and everything because it feels like that's where I come from, you know. And even though I've lived in what six, seven different countries in my life, and you know, I sp- can speak different languages, I've got friends all over the world. I've traveled a lot. For me, home will always, always be Naples. I think it it really made me understand Naples, maybe understand my old culture, maybe understand where I come from. It's such a deep. And, and kind of intimate level that I think that I'm so grateful with, you know, the choices I've made and the kind of historian I've become. And I think at the same time, it also taught me what I was telling you earlier, you know, we should always question. So it gave me this very inquisitive attitude, which I think is super important in this day and age. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so I, my, I have a teacher that he was trying to teach me history. Yeah. And he said that we cannot learn history if we don't have a map. Do you agree with this statement? Completely, 101%, 200%, heads off to your teacher, great teacher. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't learn history without a map. You really need to understand history. People think it's about it's about time, it's about the past. History is about space just as much as it is about time. Man, remember what I said earlier about transnational history and bringing in foreign stuff into our narrations of national histories you need a map i always have like well there's we can't see but there's on the wall that is a big map of europe yes we're going to put, going uh, to put a picture I, w- I will take a picture yeah. later and yeah. i have it here with the like a mold stain in the corner yes but anyway <laughs> it, 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 this is the history office it's going to be full of old stuff um but the um um understanding how geography plays a big role in history is something i'm very fascinated um, with at the moment i'm working on a new research project i'm about to begin a new research project which is about the links between environmental thinking and political thinking in the late 18th century in germany mostly and it sort of dawned upon me because i was reading some of this source and i realized man how come that everybody who's writing in this context is obsessed with how humans respond to the natural environment. It turns out that actually, you know, it was a very common concern, you know, environmental thinking was a big deal. Um, And by environmental thinking, I mostly mean how do things like geography, uh, rivers, seas, mountains, etc., like physical, geological formations affect human activity. Think about the history of migrations, for example. 
It's a huge thing. You cannot take away geography from that thing. So this touches upon, I think, a much bigger issue, which is central to where history is going now, interdisciplinarity. I love it. I love. What do you talk- mean? I love to talk to colleagues that come from different disciplines, literature, geography, science, physics, um, you know, or international relations. They live in different bubbles. In different bubbles. But isn't it stupid that uh, universities, they're still so compartmentalized? Isn't it stupid that we we do, we, we talk in history? And we don't talk about UCL. Uh, we don't talk about, UCL is a great university. And, and thank you to them that they allowed us to make this podcast here. Yeah. We love them. Um, of course, I'm obviously exaggerating a bit, but I do think that this compartmentalization of knowledge that you do history or you do geography or you do economics or you do politics is something that we're going to leave behind in a few years. I do find it so helpful. Oh, so you're saying that we narrow uh, uh, and only historians talk with historians. At the moment, historians are uh, things like yeah, that. You're saying it's yeah. so interconnected, yeah. like whatever, f- economics is so interconnected with, with uh, In my own personal historians. career in life, for example. Interesting. So, yeah. I did a degree in liberal arts in the Netherlands, in Maastricht. Shout out to Maastricht University, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Um, which was, um, and, and I did a combination of political philosophy, history, um, but also a lot of economics and international relations. And a lot of the, the, the theories and the stuff I've learned about international relations, especially with regard to migration studies, etc., is stuff that's absolutely central to my work as a historian. If I have to look at the, how ideas travel, for example, I find it so useful to refer to some of the concepts and the stuff I've learned in those um, international relation classes. So you are saying that you are missing into so much more knowledge and innovation because we compare, we compartmentalize. 100%. Exactly, exactly. I'm sure that there is so much. My mom, for example, she's a aka the only woman in my life. She is the, <laughs> she's a professor of mathematics at the University of Naples. And we often have this kind of conversation, like as a historian, I'm a historian, she's a mathematician. How can we dialogue? And it actually turns out that it just takes us five minutes to find so many topics that are at the intersection of our disciplines. A lot of famous histor- uh, authors that I write about were mathematicians, for example. And a lot of the revolutionary thinkers that took, that took part in the French revolutions, they used the tools of statistics and mathematics to predict people's behavior, voting intentions. So there is a lot of in- multidisciplinarity here. You are going to make me cry now because I think uh, you t- I understood, it was kind of funny uh, because I, uh, I was I, I was so obsessed to like okay motivation. I want to become an entrepreneur. I want to mm-hmm. make money. I want to, and, and then I understood like slowly, slowly. My he- teacher, high school teacher, which is my best friend mm-hmm. and the, the guy that was trying to teach guy, me yeah. history as well. And he told me like uh, that when you or learn about various of topics, mm-hmm. you are become a better decision making. Yeah. So when I learn about history, when I learn about philosophy, when I learn about science, I become a better YouTuber. Yeah, absolutely. And Completely. this is exactly what you're saying. Like people are missing out on so much yeah. when they think so uh, limited. It's like, you, it's like you are 2D and the world is 3D. Yeah. And I have to say it works both ways. Having this chat and actually presenting all this content which is bread and butter of my work as a historian in a format that's more sort of a public history kind of thing it's more i don't say youtube friendly but yeah youtube friendly is making me learn so much about how to present my own work and how to present my own ideas how to communicate them to an audience that i think is very different to the audience i deal with every day for starters i have no clue who's watching this right now whereas i can always interact with my student, you know what I mean? So it's a- uh, How do you feel? Is it like something uh, weird cool. for you? No, is no, it, cool. uh, is, is it one of your first podcasts uh, here? No, so I've done, I've done a couple of things in the past. I saw but... there is on, online one, but I, I didn't find more of uh, official with three cameras, yeah, with microphones. No, exactly. This is the best. Let's so, put it this way. so <laughs> now I'm sure you say that to everyone. <laughs> so <laughs> so how, how, do you f- uh, how do you find this uh, co- format of, you know, and I, is it different from your teaching? In, yeah, in the... very different. To begin with, this is very interactive. You're at, we're having a conversation. It's not even an interview. It's 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 a chat. 
Uh, well, if I give a lecture, it's just me standing there for an hour and a half talking at students or recording myself and then they watch it. When I do a seminar, it's a bit different, but it's always based on we are discussing certain sources. This is much more free flowing. Um, so it, it, I find it very stimulating, very interesting. There are so many cool ideas that kind of came up today. And I think the coolest of it all is that this more kind of free format has enabled us to see some connections that we wouldn't otherwise see if we were sticking to a more kind of scripted format, if you know what I mean? Because we've covered topics- We jumped around. The printing press of the 2008 financial crackdown. You know what I mean? It's it's a huge- uh, To your uh, love about Naples that we mentioned 1,000 times, exactly. 10,000 times. My mother as well, you know? <laughs> so, um, so jokes aside, I think it's really cool. And I, I do think that this is the future of history. You know, think historians talk, think about the past. I like to think about what's the future for historians. And it's definitely, Definitely, this kind of more public history um, sort of formats. It's, it's, I think, also has to do with crossing, with erasing this boundary between academia and non-academic context. I really, really don't feel comfortable with, with this s- strong distinction. Um, and I do think that there's so much room for history in the public sphere. And people are eager. People like to talk about history. People like to listen to podcasts and, and documentaries about history. People are interested in history. So why are we historian kind of locking ourselves up in our offices? We should bring the message out. And that's why the podcast is a great initiative. So and I don't, I'm going to do a compliment in a way to you because when I, before I came to this podcast, I was in a house here in uh, London. And one of the people that were in the house was a student of yours. Uh, you were teaching him philosophy a lot of years uh, ago, okay. and he, I, I asked him how was he, <laughs> and he was, he, he, he was so in love with you. He's like, he's young, he's crazy, he's like, so. Okay, uh, you need, uh, you need to tell me who this was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's from Cyprus as well. One guy with <laughs> with a beard, but uh, uh, ah, I know who this. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, it's so, uh, and uh, my question is like. How, what is the relationship that you have you, with your students and how uh, it's helpful that you are so close to their age? I absolutely love my students. They are <laughs> the best thing in the university. <laughs> so let me explain why. I, um, in the UK, there is this misconception, this common perception that research is all that matters. And I really disagree with that. Teaching is so much more important. I, I find it so stimulating, so interesting, so engaging. I get to talk to people about stuff. If I'm doing research, I'm just writing it down and then publishing something. And then where's the feedback? Where's the interaction? I want it to be more interactive. I want to get people interested. I cannot convey my passion for something in an article or in a book. I need to be able to make a case for it. I need to argue why this stuff is cool more than interesting. So that's why I think my students are, um, they like my teaching. Now, obviously the fact that I'm still young, I hope, um, is, is helpful. <laughs> what do you mean you hope? <laughs> because I feel every year, I feel like, well, of course I'm getting every year older, but I also feel that the students, because they're always first, second, third year MA, they always stay the same age. I just get older and older, they stay the same age. So, but jokes aside, I think it's, um, I remember very well what it's like to be a student. And to be honest, I never stopped thinking of myself as a student. I still introduce myself as like a 13th year university student. You know what I mean? It's, um, uh, I, you never stop learning. That's the most important thing. So uh, because I can, I, I can step in their shoes and really see uh, the learning process from their perspective so close, I think that's what makes me so relatable. Uh, and then also because I make a lot, a lot of jokes, I think when I teach, or I don't know. I, I like to put a lot of memes, for example, in my lectures. So <laughs> that I think helps as well. Um, no, but I think jokes aside, I love the students. I, it's just so rewarding. It makes me feel good about my job. If I, I always say, you know, if um, students come out of my courses feeling like, I think differently about this topic. I know I've done my good job, uh, my job well, and I know that that's the most rewarding thing imaginable. I'm really committed to uh, making them learn. What do you want to leave behind in this world? So, okay, you're, you're in LA, so you'll appreciate the reference. You know the show with David Duchovny, Californication? 
No. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's fantastic. It tells the story of a writer who moves from, I think, New York to LA, and it goes through a whole series of random, complicated, wacky stuff. It's some sort of like very, it's a very kind of dark comedy and it's a brilliant show. You should watch it. It's fantastic. There is a scene in one episode in which he asks this question, how do you, somebody asks him the question, how do you want to leave your mark in the world? And his answer is, I want to leave my mark in the, my mark in the world by empowering other people to leave their mark in the world. And that is how I understand my role in this university. That was a good answer. <laughs> oh, I, and I feel forced to end it here. <laughs> that was beautifully said. Thank you for your time. Thank my you so much I love, you I love your passion you have about life. This is energizes me. I'm sure it energizes the people watching as well. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming, Fides. And, and best of luck with all your future podcasts and endeavors. And <laughs> Thank you for watching, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>